Welcome to the Myth, Legend, and Lore podcast. The Saga of Thorstein, the King's Son. 13. In the next place, it is to be told that Thorstein lay among the slain, so tired out that he was wholly unable to help himself, but he was but little wounded. And toward the end of the night, he heard a wagon coming along the ice. Then he saw a man following the wagon, and he saw that that man was his father. And when the man came to the field of battle, He cleared his way, throwing the dead out of his path, but he threw none with more force than the sons of the king. He saw that all were dead except Thorstein and Thorar. He then asked them whether they could speak at all, and Thorar said that he could. Still, the viking saw that he was covered with gaping wounds. Thorstein said he was not wounded, but very tired. The viking took Thorar in his lap, and then it seemed to Thorstein that his father, in spite of his age, showed great strength. Thorstein went to the wagon himself and laid himself in it with his weapons. Then Viking drove on with the wagon. The weather began to grow dark and cloudy, and it changed so fast that in a very little while the whole ice seemed to begin to give way. Just at that time when they had landed, all the ice had melted out of the lake. Then Viking went home to his bedchamber. Close by his bed was the entrance to an underground dwelling and down into it he took his sons, and it was enough food and drink, and clothing and all things that might be needed. The viking healed the wounds of his son Thorer, for he was a good leech. One end of the house stood in a forest, and here viking very strongly warned his sons never to leave the underground dwelling, for he said it was sure that Ogauten would straightway find out that they were alive. And then, added he, we may soon look for war. As to this, they made good promises. Time passed on until Thoru became altogether whole again. It was now talked abroad throughout the country that all the sons of the king were dead. But, nevertheless, it was talked somewhat after Ogauten that it was not sure whether Thoru was dead or not. Then Yoko bade him seek and try to find out with certainty where Thoru had his dwelling place. Now Ogauten fell into deep thinking but still he did not become any surer about Thorer. One day it happened that Thorer said to Thorstein, I'm getting very tired of staying in this underground dwelling, now the weather is fine, and my will is that we take a walk into the forest to amuse ourselves. Answered Thorstein, I will not, for then we would be breaking the bidding of our father. Nevertheless, I shall go, said Thorer. Thorstein had no mind to stay behind, and so they went to the forest and spent the day there amusing themselves. But in the evening, when they were about to go home again, they saw a little she-fox scenting round about her in all directions, and snuffing under every tree. Said Thorer, What satanic being goes there, brother? Answered Thorstein, I really do not know. It seems to me that I have once seen something like it, namely the night before Yoko's visit to the shed. And I think that we have here the cursed Ogauten. He then took a spear, which he shot at the fox, but she crept down into the ground. After this they went home to their underground dwelling, and did not let on that anything had happened. Shortly afterward, the old viking came there and said, Now you have done a bad thing, having broken what I bade you by leaving the cave. And this Ogauten has found out that you are here. I therefore expect the brothers will soon come with war upon us. 14. Shortly after this, Ogauten had a talk with Yoko and said, It is indeed true that I am your right and not your left hand. What is there now about that? asked Yoko. 
answered Ogarten. It is that the brothers Thorer and Thorstein are still alive at Vikings and are hid by him, answered Yukul. Then I will gather together men and will not give up until we have their lives. Yukul got together eighty men, among whom there were thirty of the king's courtiers, all well busked as to clothes. In the evening they were bussed for setting out, being about to leave the next morning. Two young loafers, of whom one was called Vot and the other Thumal, had just come there, and when they had gone to bed in the evening, Vot spoke to Thumal. Do you not think it wise, brother, that we arise and go to Viking and tell him of Yoko's plans? For I know it will be the bane of Viking if they come upon him unawares, and it is our duty to go and help him. Made answer Thumal. You are very foolish. Do you not think the watchman will become aware of us if we travel by night? And then we shall be killed without giving any help to Viking. Said Vot. You always show that you are a coward, but although you dare not move a step, I will nevertheless go and tell Viking what is about to be done, for I will gladly lose my life if I can hinder the death of Viking and his sons, for he has often been kind to me. Then Vot arose and dressed himself, and likewise so did Thuma, for the latter had now no mind of staying in bed alone. Now they went their way, and came to Vikings at midnight, and aroused him from his sleep. Vot told him that Yoko was to be looked for there, with a large number of men. Said Viking, Well you have done, dear Vot, and your deed surely deserves a reward. Then Viking called together some men from the neighbourhood, so that he had thirty men. Then he went down to his sons in the cave, and told them the state of things. Said Thora, They shall be withstood if they come, for we will come up out of the cave and fight together with you. Answered Viking, You shall not. Let us foresee how our fight may turn out, and if it should look hopeless to me, then I will go to that place below which is your cave and make a great noise, and then you must come up and help me. Thorstein said he would do so, and so Viking went away. After daybreak, Viking and all his men chose their weapons. He took the Kizia called Harik's loom in his hand, but everybody thought he would not be able to wield it on account of its weight, he being so old. A wonderful change then seemed to take place, for as soon as Viking had put the armour on, he seemed to be young a second time. A large yard was enclosed by a high wall in front of Viking's byre. It formed a very good vantage point, and from here he and his men busked themselves for the battle, and weapons were given to Vot and Thumal. 15. Now it is to be told that Yokel busked himself and all his army for starting early the next morning, and he did not halt in his march before he came to the dwellings of Viking. Viking was standing outside on the wall of the yard, and bade Yokel and all his men come in. Answered Yokel, Quite otherwise, if you desert, than that we should accept your invitation. Our errand here is that you give up those mishap bringing men, Thorstein and Thora. I will not do it, answered Viking. Nevertheless, I will not deny that both of them have been here, but I would sooner give myself up than them. Now you may attack us if you like, but I and my men will ward ourselves. They now made a hard attack, but Viking and his men warded themselves bravely. Thus some time passed. Then Yokel tried to scale the wall. Viking and his men slew many men, but now all his own men began to fall. Then Viking went to the place over the underground dwelling, struck his shield hard, and made a fearful noise. This Thorer heard, and said to Thorstein, We ought to make haste, and for all that we may be too late, for I think our father has fallen already. Thorstein said he was quite ready, and when they came out, only Vot and Thumal and three other men were standing with Viking. Nevertheless, Viking was not wounded yet, he was only very tired. As soon as the brothers came out, Thorstein turned to the spot where Yokel was standing, but Thorer went to Ogauten and his men stood. Twelve of King Njorf's men attacked Viking and his men. Viking warded himself and was not wounded by the men who were against him. Their leader was called Bjorn. In a short time, Thorer slew all the followers of Ogauten and stabbed at him with his sword, but Ogauten thrust himself down into the ground so that only the soles of his feet could be seen. Thorstein attacked Yokel. Said Vot. A 
It is well that you are trying each other's bravery, or Yoko could never bear to hear that Thorstein was a match for him in anything. Now, there was a very hard battle between Thorstein and Yoko, and it so turned out that Yoko, scarred with many wounds, bounded back and fell down outside of the wall. But when Yoko had gone away, the king gave quarter to the men of the king's court that were still alive, and sent them away with suitable gifts, begging them to bring his friendly greetings to King Njorfa. And when Yoko came home, Ogauten was there already. Yoko blamed him bitterly for having fled before anybody else. To this made answer, Ogauten, it was not possible to stay in the fight any longer, and truly, it may be said that there had to do with trolls rather than with men. But Yoko found that his words rather overdid the matter. Somewhat later, King Njorfa's men, to whom quarter had been given by Viking and his men, came home, bringing Viking's greetings to King Njorfa and telling him of all the kind treatment that they had gotten from Viking, said the king. Truly, is Viking unlike most other men? On account of his high-mindedness and all his bravery, and now, my son, Yoko, I speak the truth when I solemnly forbid any war to be waged against Viking from this time forward. Answered Yoko, I cannot bear to have the slayers of my brothers in the garth next to me, and in a word, I declare that Viking and his sons shall never live in peace so far as I am concerned, and I shall never cease persecuting them before they are all sent to hell. Answered the king, then I shall try and see who of us two is the more blessed with friends. For all those who are willing to follow me, I will go and help Viking. Seems to me to be of great weight that you do not become the bane of Viking. For if that should follow, I would be forced to do one of two things. Either to have you killed, and that would be the cause of evil talk, or to break my oaths which I have sworn. Namely, that I would avenge Viking if I should outlive him. And thus he ended his speech. The king had a talk with his sons and said to them, Owing to Yoko's power, I dare not keep you here, but there is another matter of still more weight, and that is that I do not want any discord to arise between me and King Njorfa. Said Thorstein, What will you advise us to do? Answered the king, There is a man by the name of Halfdan, who rules over Vags, Bags is on the other side of yonder mountain. Halfdan is an old friend and a foster brother. To him I will send you, and commend you to his goodwill. But there are many dangerous hindrances in the way, especially two hut dwellers, one of whom is worse to deal with than the other. The name of one of them is Sam, and the other is called Full Affle. The latter has a dog called Gram, with which it is almost as dangerous to deal with as the robber himself. Now, I am not sure that you will reach Bags. But you may escape both of these robbers, for there is a chasm along the mountain so deep and broad that I do not know anyone who has passed it but my foster brothers and myself. But I should think indeed it is more likely that Thorstein might pass it, whereas I feel less hopeful about Thorer. Shortly afterward, the brothers busked themselves before setting out, having all their weapons with them. Then Viking gave the Kizia to Thorer and he handed a gold ring to his son Thorstein, begging him to give it to Hafdan as a token of their old friendship. Now be patient, my son Thorer, says Viking. Although Hafdan may be peevish toward you, or does not look much to you or your errand. Then the sons took leave of their father. They were so deeply moved that the tears trickled down his cheeks. Viking looked after them as they were going away and said, I shall never in my life see you again, and nevertheless you, my son Thorstein, will reach an old age and become a very distinguished man. And now farewell, and all hail to you both. Then the old man returned home, but his sons climbed the mountain until they reached the hut in the evening. The door was half shut. Thorer stepped over to it, and by using all his strength he pushed it open, and when they had entered the hut they saw there was a great deal of wares and supplies of all kinds. There was a large bed, and at nightfall the hut dweller, a man of somewhat frowning look, came home. He said, Are you here, you mishap bringing men, you sons of Viking, Thorstein and Thorer, who have slain the seven sons of Njurfa? And now all their ill luck shall come to an end, 
or it will be an easy matter for me to strike you to the ground. Who is that, says Thora, who boastingly insults us? Answered the robber. My name is Sam. I'm the son of Svart. My brother's name is Falaf. He is the boss in the other hut. Said Thorstein. I see that Fain is causing us two brothers, if you alone kill both of us. And therefore I do not hesitate to test our valour, but Thor shall stand by without taking any part in our combat. At the same time, Sam suddenly ran under Thorstein with such great speed that the latter lost the hold he had gotten, but still did not fall. Then Thor ran to Sam, stabbing him with his kezia on one side, so that it came out the other side, and thus Sam fell down dead. They stopped there during the night and had a good rest, for there was plenty of food. They made the hut warm, but did not carry away a fee with them. In the morning, they left the hut, but in the evening of the same day they came to another, much larger than the former one. There, also the door was half shut. Thor stepped over to the door, intending to push it open, but he could not. He used all his strength, but the door would not open. Then Thorstein stepped over to the door, and pushed it until it gave way, and so they went inside. On the one side there was a stack of wares, and on the other one of logs. A bed was placed in the inner part of the hut, crosswise, and it was so large that they were surprised at its size. At one end of the bed was something like a large round bedstead, and they judged that it must be the couch of the dog Graham. Then they seated themselves and built a fire before them, and long after nightfall, they heard heavy footsteps outside. Presently the door was opened, and a giant of stupendous stature entered, carrying bound on his back a large bear and a string of fowl on his breast. He laid his burden down on the floor, saying, Here I have miscreants, the sons of Viking, who on account of their ill-fated deeds are held in the worst repute throughout the whole land. How did you escape the hands of my brother Sam? We escaped in such a manner, said Thorstein, that he lay dead on the spot. Said Fool Athel, you have taken advantage of him in his sleep. By no means, said Thorstein. We fought him, and my brother Thoder slew him. Said Fool Athel, she'll not add us an anything toward you tonight. She'll stay here till tomorrow morning and have whatever food you want. Then the hut dweller cut his game to pieces took a table and put victuals on it, whereupon they all took to eating, and after their supper they went to bed. The two brothers slept together in some marketable cloaks, but all growled as passed him by. Neither party tried to deceive the other. In the morning both parties arose early, said Fulafel. Now, Thorstein, let us try each other's strength. Let Thorder fight with my dog in another place, answered Thorstein. That shall be according to your wish. Now they went out of the hut and over to the lawn which fronted it, and suddenly the dog, with his jaws wide open, leapt upon Thor. Both Thor and the dog fought fiercely, for the dog warded off every blow with his tail, and when Thor tried to pierce him with his kezia, he escaped by biting the weapon at every stab. Thus they fought for three hours, and Thor had not yet succeeded in wounding him. Once Cram suddenly darted upon Thorer and bit a slice out of his calf. At the same time, Thorer stabbed the dog with his kezia, pinning him to the ground, and soon after Cram expired. But awful Athel is as be told that he had a large and meeker sword in his hand, and Thorstein had his sword also. He had a long and severe struggle, for Phil Athel was wont to deal heavy blows, but his anchor fatal bit armour no less than flesh, he fell dead and Thorstein was wholly without a wind. 16. Now the brothers readied themselves for leaving, and continued their walk until they reached the great chasm, which it seemed to Thorstein it would be very dangerous to pass. Nevertheless, he made himself ready to leap over the abyss, and did it. He was immediately followed by Thor, but when Thorstein had reached the other side of the chasm and looked round, Thor had just reached the same side, and was falling down into the chasm. Thorstein succeeded, however, in seizing him and pulling him up again. I said Thorstein then, Brother, you always show that you are a dauntless fellow, so you did now too, for you might know it would be certain death if you were to fall into the chasm. 
It did not happen this time, answered Coder. But you saved me, as you have done so often before. Then they proceeded on their journey, until they came to a large river which was both deep and rapid. Thorstein said they must look for the ford, but without delay Thorer waded into the river, and not far from the bank the water was so deep that the bottom could not be reached, and therefore he had to sustain himself by swimming. Thorstein, not being minded to be standing on the bank, threw himself into the river and swam after him. Thus they reached the other bank, where they wrung their wet clothes. But while they were doing this, the weather grew so bitterly cold that their clothes rose hard as stone, and so they could not put them on. At the same time, a fearful snowstorm arose, and it was thought that Algauten was the cause of it. Thorstein asked Thorer what was the best thing for them to do. Answered Thorer, I think we can do nothing better than dip our clothes in the river, for in cold water things soon thaw out. So they did, and thereby they were able to put on their clothes again. Then they went on until they came to the buyer of bags. It being night when they came there, the door of the house was locked so they could not enter. They kept knocking at the door a long time, but nobody came to it. In the yard lay a beam twenty fathoms long. This they brought up on the roofs of the houses, and they rode upon it in such a manner that every timber began to creak, and all the inmates of the house became so frightened that they each ran to his corner. Then the half done went to the door and out into the front yard, and the brothers now went over to him and greeted him. Halfdan gave them a cold and reserved answer, asking them, however, for their names. They gave him their names, adding that they were the sons of Jarl Viking, and that they brought greetings from the latter to him. Said Halfdan, I cannot talk about foster brothership between us. To me it seems that many a man keeps his word of foster brothership, but middlingly well and no more. And as for you, you have slain the most of King Njorf's sons. It also seems to me that you have not regarded the sanctity of foster brothership in any respect to many of Njorf's descendants. Still, you may enter my house and lodge here tonight, if you like. Then Halfdan went in at a swinging pace, followed by the brothers. They entered the stofa, where there were but few persons. Nobody took the clothes of the brothers, and thus they sat during the evening, till people began to go to bed. Then a dish containing porridge and a spoon in each end of it was placed on the table before them. Thoror began to eat the porridge. Said Thorstein then, You are very inconsistent in your regard to your pride. And so saying, he took the dish and threw it on the floor in the further part of the room, so that it broke to pieces. Hereupon the people went to bed. The brothers had no bed, and got but very little sleep during the night. Early in the morning they got up and readied themselves for leaving. But when they had got outside the door, the old man came to them and asked, What did you say last night? Or whose sons did you say you were? He made answer Thorer. What more do you know now than when we told you you were the sons of Jarl Viking? Said Thorstein, Here is a golden finger ring, which he begged me to give to you. Said Thorer, I think you will be worse off who shows him anything of it. Answered Thorstein, Be not so peevish, brother. Here is the gold ring, as a token that you should receive us in a manner that we might be comforted and protected at your house. Halfdan took the ring, became glad, and said, Why should I not receive you and do all good in my power for you? To do so is my duty, on account of my relations to my friend Viking. You seem to be men blessed with good luck. Said Thor. The adage is indeed a true one, as it's good to have two mouths for the two kinds of speech. Last night, soon after we had come to you, you treated us quite otherwise. I am therefore inclined to think you a coward, and you everywhere show your slyness. Said Thorstein. Let us be patient, half done with my brother. Although he is cross with you in his words, for he is a reckless man in his words and his doings. Answered Halfdan, I have heard that you are the most doughty of men, and that Thorir is hot-tempered and reckless. So I think you are in every respect a man of more spirit. Hereupon they went into the house. Their clothes were taken off them, and every attention was shown to them. They stayed there during the winter and enjoyed the most hearty treatment. But in the beginning of spring, Thorstein said to Hafton, 
We shall now leave this place, answered Hakdan. What is your best advice? Made answer Thorstein. I wish you could give me a ship, manned with a crew, for I intend to set out and wage war and gain booty. To this, Hafton gave his consent. After readying themselves properly, they sailed to the south, along the coast of the country, until they met with two vessels, which had been sent out by their father, and were filled with men and many good weapons. Now, Thorstein sent back the ship, which had been given to him by Hafton, and sent the crew with it. But the brothers became skippers, one on each of the two ships. They waged wars in many places during the summer, and gained much fee and fame. In the fall they landed on an island which was ruled by the Bondi, whose name was Grim. He bade them stay with him through the winter, and they accepted his offer. Grim was married and had only one daughter, by the name of Thora, a tall and fine-looking girl. Thora fell in love with her, and told his brother Thorstein he wanted to marry her. Thorstein talked about the matter to Grim the Bondi, but the latter flatly refused to give his consent. Answered Thorstein, then I challenge you to fight with me in Hongang, and he who wins shall be the master of your daughter. Grim said he was ready for the Hongang. The next day they took a blanket, which they threw under their feet, and then they fought the whole day very bravely. But in the evening they parted, neither of them having received any wound. The second and third days they fought, but the results were the same as the first. One day Thorir asked the daughter of the Bondi how it came to pass that Grim could not be vanquished. She said there was in the forepart of his helmet a stone, which made him quite invincible, as long as it was not taken away from him. This Thorir told to Thorstein, and on the fourth day of their fight, Thorstein threw his sword, grasping the helmet of his antagonist with both his hands, with such great force that the cords of the helmet were severed. Shortly after, he attacked Grim, and now Thorstein's greater strength was shown. He brought Grim down, but gave him quarter. Then Grim asked who had advised him to take the helmet. Thorstein said that it was Thora who had told it to Thora. Then she wants to be married, answered Grim, and so it shall be. Thus it was resolved that Thora should marry Thora. In the beginning of the spring, Thorstein set out to carry on wars, leaving his brother at home. The newly married couple took to loving each other very much, and they got a son who they named Harold. This was their only child. He afterward took his father's Kizir, after which he was nicknamed, and was called Harald Kizir. 17. The king was named Skate, a son of Eric, who again was a son of Mindel Mithofsson. Skate was a king in Song, and with his queen he had two children, a son named Beli, who was a very excellent man, and a daughter called Ingeborg. At this time she was not in the kingdom, having been spellbound and thus removed from the country. Skate had been a berserk and a very great viking, and he had forced his way onto the throne of Song. There was a man called Thorgrim, and who had to defend the realm against the invasion of foes. He was a great champion and a warlike man, but not over faithful. Between Thorgrim and the king's son, Beli, there was a warm friendship, and Beli had great celebrity throughout all lands. It happened, after King's Gate had grown very old, both of his children still being young, that two Vikings, one named Gauten and the other Og Gauten, had landed in his country. They had taken the king by surprise and offered him two conditions, either to fight a battle with them or to give up his land and become a Jarl under them. King's Gate, though he had no troops to meet them with, would rather die with honour than live with shame. He would rather fall in his kingdom than serve his foes. He therefore went to battle, having no other troops than his courtiers. Thorgrim escaped with the king's son, Beli, but Ingeborg remained at home in her bower. In the combat with Ogauten, King Skate fell with honour, but those of his men who escaped death in the battlefield fled to the woods. Now Ogauten took the kingdom into his charge, and he had given the title of king to himself. He asked Ingeborg to become his wife, but she flatly refused, saying she would rather kill herself than marry the bane of her father, and such a villain too, as Ogauten. For you, she said, are more like the devil himself than like a man. 
At this, Ogauten grew angry and said, I shall reward you for your foul language. I hereby enchant you, so that you shall get the same stature and looks as my sister, Skulinefya, and the same nature also as she, as far as you may be capable of assuming it. And, spellbound, you shall inhabit that cave which is on the deep river, and shall never escape out of this enchanted state, till some man of noble birth is willing to have you, and pledges himself to marry you. Still, you can never escape until I am dead. But my sister shall wear your looks, said Ingeborg. I cause you to be so enchanted that you shall keep this kingdom only for a short time, and never have any good of your reign. The spells pronounced by Ogauten proved true, and Ingeborg disappeared. Soon afterwards, the king's son, Beli, came thither again, together with Thorgrim and many other men. It was night, and they set fire to the upper story of the house in which the two brothers slept, and burnt it up, together with the people who lived in it, except the brothers who had escaped through an underground passage and fled, without stopping until they came to the court of King Njorfa. Beli took possession of his country again, and Thorgrim remained in his former position as a warder of the king's land. 18. A king named Viliam ruled over Valon. He was a wise man and blessed with many friends. He had a daughter called Olof, and she was a woman of great culture. Now it is to be told that Yoko, Njorfa's son, after the departure of the sons of Viking, made Thorstein and Thora outlaws in every place within the boundaries of his kingdom. King Njorfa did not consent to it, for he and Viking kept their friendship during their whole life. Once Algautin had a talk with Yoko and asked him if he would not like to get married. Yoko asked him where he saw a match for him. Answered Algautin, William of Valent has a daughter named Olof, and I think a marriage with her would add to your honour, said Yoko. Why then not make up our minds as to the subject? So they readied themselves for the voyage, and together with sixty men they sailed for Valon. Here they paid a visit to King William, who received Yoko very heartily, for his father, Njorfa, was well known throughout all lands. Yoko asked for Olaf in marriage, and Ogauten pleaded with the king in his behalf, but the latter appealed to his daughter. And straight away after this conversation, Thirty brave-looking men entered the hall. The one who went before them was the tallest and fairest, and he went up to the king and greeted him. As soon as Ogauten saw these men, his voice fell, his beard sunk, and he begged Yoko and his other men not to mention his name, so long as they stayed in that land. The king asked the stately men their names, and the chief called himself Beli, and said he was the son of Skate, the king, who was the ruler of Song. My errand hither, he added, is to woo your daughter. Made answer the king. Yokel, the son of Njorfa, came here before you on the same errand. Now I will settle the matter in this way, that she choose herself which one of the two wooers she will have. Then the king placed Billy on one side of himself, and there was a great banquet. After three nights, they took a walk to the bower of the princess, asking her which one of the two wooers, Yokel or Belly, she would like to marry and it soon appeared that she would rather marry Belly. But at that moment, Ogauten threw a piece of wood into her lap, whereby her nature was suddenly changed, to an extent that she refused Belly and married Yoko. Then Belly returned to his ships. Yoko and Belly had formerly been on good terms, so that some people say that Belly had gotten a reward for killing Thorstein and Thorder. Belly did not blame Yoko, though the daughter of the king declined to marry him for the matter depended on her decision. Thereupon, Beli went home to his kingdom, and after the wedding, Yokel also repaired homeward, accompanied by Og Outen. 19. Now our saga must turn to Thorstein, at a time when he was returning home from his warfare, bound for Grim the Bondi, where his brother Thor resided in that island. Yokel got news of Thorstein's voyages, he spoke to Ogauten, asking him to try his tricks and by witchcraft bring about a storm against Thorstein in order that he might be drowned, together with all his men. Ogauten said he would try, 
no matter what the result might be. Then, with his incantations, he caused so tremendous a storm against Thorstein that his ships were wrecked amid the tumultuous waves, and all his crew perished. Thorstein held out well a long time, but at last he became tired of swimming, and then he had reached the surf and was beginning to sink down. At this moment, he saw an old woman of very great stature wading from the shore out toward him. She wore a shriveled skin cloak, which fell to her feet in the front, but was very short behind, and her face was very large and like that of a monster. She stepped over to him, seizing him up from the sea, and said, Will you accept life from me, Thorstein? Answered he, Why should I not? Or what is your name? Said she, My name is uncommon. It is Skelinefia. But you will have to make some sacrifice in return for your life. Said he, What is it? Made answer she, That you grant me the favour that I ask of you. Said Thorstein, you will ask nothing from me that will not bring me good luck, but when shall the favour be granted? Answered she, Not yet. Then she bore him ashore, and now he had come to that island which was governed by Grim. She then wrestled with him till he grew warm, whereupon they parted, each wishing the other success. Then she walked on, for she said she had other places to call at. But Thorstein went home to the byre, and his meeting there with his brother was the cause of great joy to both of them. And so Thorstein remained there for the winter, and very much was made of him. Now we must turn to Yoko and Algauten, as they were sailing homeward. One very fine day it happened that their ship was suddenly shrouded in darkness, accompanied by such a biting frost and cold that nobody on board dared to turn his face to the wind. They all covered their faces with their clothes, but when the weather had cleared off again, they saw a Gautin hanging in the hole of the masthead, and he was dead. Yoko looked upon his death as a great loss, and returning to his kingdom, he remained quiet. Early the next spring, Thorstein and Thorer readied themselves for a voyage, intending to visit their father, Viking. And when they came as far as to Deep River, before they knew of it, Yoko came there to greet them with thirty men. A combat between them straightway began. Yoko was very eager in the fight, and so was his brother Grim. Thorer and Thorstein defended themselves bravely, and a long time passed before these brothers received any wounds from Yoko and his men. For not only did Thorstein deal heavy blows, but Angervadil also bit iron as well as cloth. Thorer defended himself excellently, although he did not have his kizia, which he had left at home. He and Grim met, and they fought very bravely. Still, at the end of the fight, it was Grim that fell to the ground, dead. By this time, Thorstein had slain eighteen men. But as might be expected, he was both tired and winded, and so was Thorer. Then the brothers turned their backs together, and still defended themselves well. Now, Yoko, with his eleven men, pursued them and made so valiant an attack that Thorer fell. Then Thorstein defended himself manfully, until there remained no more than Yokel and three of his men. But then Yokel stabbed Thorstein with his sword, wounding him in the upper part of the thigh, and Yokel being a strong man, and bearing on the sword with all his might while he stabbed him. Thorstein, who was very tired, and was standing on the very edge of the riverbank, fell down from the crag, while it was all that Yokel could do to stop himself, so that he did not fall also. After this, Yokel went home, thinking he had slain Thorstein and Thorer, and having come home he remained quiet. But now it is to be told of Thorstein, that he, having fallen from the crag, alighted upon a grassy spot among the rocks, but being tired and wounded, he was unable to move, and yet he was in full senses after he had fallen. And Gervadal fell out of his hand and down into the river. Thorstein was lying there betwixt life and death, and expecting soon to breathe his last. But before he had lain thus very long, he saw Skelinefia coming. She was clad in her skin gown, and looked no fairer than before. She approached the place where Thorstein was lying, and said, It seems to me, Thorstein, that your misfortunes will never come to an end. 
and now you seem ready to be breathing your last. But will you grant me the favour upon which we formally agreed? Said Thorstein, do not now find myself able to render much of any service to you. Made answer she, my request is that you promise to marry me, and then I will try to heal your wounds. Said Thorstein, I did not know as I had better make that promise, for to me you look like a monster. Said she, still, you have your choice between these two things. You must either marry me or lose your life. And in the latter case, you break in the bargain the oath which you swore to me when you pledged yourself to grant my favour after I saved you at Grimm's Island. Said Thorstein. There is much truth in your words, and it is better to keep one's promise. As I vow I will marry you, and you will prove to be my best helper in my time of need. Still, I should like to stipulate with you that you get me my sword back, so that I might wear it in case my life is prolonged. Says she, so be it. And having taken him up in her skin gown, she leaped, as if quite unencumbered, up over the crags and proceeded until a large cave was before them. Having entered the cave, she bandaged Thorstein's wounds and laid him on a soft bed, and within seven nights he was almost healed. One day, Scalinefia had left the cave, and in the evening when she came back, it was with the sword, which was then dripping wet, and she gave it to Thorstein, and said, Now I have saved your life twice, and given you your sword back, of which you are fonder than aught else. And a fourth thing, which is of great importance to both of us, is that I hanged Ogarten, and yet you have completely rewarded me, for you have delivered me from the spellbound condition into which Ogauten enchanted me. My name is Ingeborg. I am the daughter of King Skate and the sister of Beli. But my only means of delivery from bondage was that some man of noble birth should promise to marry me. Now you have done this, and I am free from bondage. Now you must ready yourself for leaving the cave and follow my advices, and you will find my brother Beli and four men with him. Among the latter will be his land warden, Lorgren Kobe. From Yokel they have received money, offered as a price for your head, and they will begin a battle with you. I do not care if you kill Thorgrim and his companions, but spare the life of my brother Beli, or I should like to have you become his foster brother. And if you have a mind to marry me, then go with him home to Song and woo me. I shall be there before you, and it may be that I will look otherwise to you than now. Then they parted and he had not gone far before he met Beli, accompanied by four men, and at their meeting, Thorgrim said, It is good, Thorstein, that we have found each other. Now we will try to win the price put upon your head by Yokel. Said Thorstein, It seems possible to me that you may lose the fee, and forfeit your life too. 20. Now we must tell about Thorstein, that he was attacked by Beli and his men, but he defended himself well and bravely, and the result was that Thorgrim and three of his companions fell. Then Thorstein and Beli entered a new contest. Thorstein defended himself, but would not wound Beli. Beli kept on attacking Thorstein, until the latter seized him and set him down at his side, saying, You are wholly in my power, but I will not only give you your life, but also offer you an opportunity to become my foster brother. You shall be king and I shall be hairseer. And in addition to this, I will woo your sister Ingeborg and get her estate since home as a dowry. Said Beli, This is no very easy matter, for my sister has disappeared so that nobody knows what has become of her. Answered Thorstein, She may have come back. Said Beli, I do not see how she could get a dottier fellow than you are, and I give you my full consent to the proposition. Having settled this with their words of honour, they went home to Song. Beli soon became aware that his sister had come back, and that she had not lost any of that blooming beauty that she had had before in her youthful days. Thorstein began his suit, and asked that Ingeborg might become his wife. This was resolved upon. As a dowry, 
She got from her home all the possessions lying on the other side of the fjord. The byre where Thorstein resided was called Framnes, but the byre governed by Beli was called Sirstrand. The next spring, Thorstein and Beli set out to wage wars, having five ships, and during the summer they harried far and wide and got enough of booty, but in the fall they returned home again, having seven ships. The next summer they went out harrying again, but got very little booty, for all Vikings shunned them, and having reached the small rocky islands called Elfarskia, they anchored in a harbour late in the evening. Thorstein and Beli went ashore and crossed the ness toward which their ships were lying. But having crossed the ness, they saw twelve ships covered with black tilts. On shore they saw tents from which smoke arose, and they seemed to be sure that these tents must be occupied by cooks. Having taken on a disguise, they went thither, and having come to the door of a tent, they both placed themselves in it in such a manner that the smoke did not find any way out. The cooks made use of abusive words and asked what sort of beggars they were, as they were guileful enough to want them burnt alive or smothered. Belly and Thorstein made an ugly disturbance and answered with hoarse voices that they came to get food. Or, said they, who is the excellent man who commands the fleet lying here at the shore? They said, You must be stupid old men if you have not heard of Ufa who is called Uffa the Unlucky, and is the son of Herbrand the Big-Headed. This Uffa is a brother of Utenfaxi, and we know there are no other men under the sun more celebrated than these two brothers. I said Thorstein, you tell good tidings. Shortly after, Thorstein and Billy returned to their own men, and early the next morning, having readied themselves, they rode around the ness and immediately shouted the cry of battle. The others then quickly readied themselves, took their weapons, and a vehement battle began. Uffa had more men, and was himself a most valiant warrior. They fought for a long time, in such a manner that it could not be seen which side would gain the victory. But, on the third day, Thorstein began to board the dragon commanded by Uffa the Unlucky, and he was followed without delay by Beli, and a great havoc they made, killing all who were between the prow and the mast of the ship. Then Uffe came from the poop and attacked Beli, and they fought for some time, until Beli began to get wounds from Uffa, who handled his weapon dexterously and dealt heavy blows. Meanwhile, Thorstein came with Angerbadel and gave Uffa a blow with it. The sword hit the helmet, split the whole body and the burning clad man from head to foot, and Angerbadel struck against the mast beam so forcibly that both its edges sunk out of sight. Said Beli, this blow of yours, foster brother, will live in the memory of men as long as the north is peopled. Hereupon, they offered the Vikings two terms, either to give up and save their lives, or to have a combat. But they preferred to accept a quarter from Thorstein and Beli. The latter gave a pardon to all, and they eagerly accepted it. Here much booty was taken, and having stayed three nights, during which the time the wounded were healed, they repaired home in the autumn. 21. At springtime, the foster brothers readied themselves for leaving home, and had fifteen ships. Beli commanded the dragon, which had been owned by Uffa the Unlucky. It was a choice ship, its beak and stern being whittled and carved and extensively overlaid with gold. King Beli got the dragon, for it was the choicest part of the booty which they had taken from the slain Uffa it always being their custom to give to Beli the most costly parts of the booty. No ship was thought better than this dragon, except Lide, which was owned by Uffa's brother, Utenfaxi. Uffa and Utenfaxi had inherited these ships from their father, Herbrand, and Lide was the better of the two in these respects, as it had a fair wind wherever it sailed, and it almost understood human speech. But. The reason why Utenfaxi and not Uffa had gotten Elide was that Uffa had fallen into such bad luck that he had killed both his father and his mother, and it seemed to Utenfaxi that if justice should be done, Uffa had forfeited his right of inheritance. And Utenfaxi was the superior of the two brothers on account of his strength, stature, and witchcraft. Now the foster brothers went out harrying and waged wars far and wide in the waters of the Baltic, but they found very few Vikings, 
for everybody upon hearing of them fled out of their reach. At this time, there were none more celebrated for their harrying exploits than Thorstein and Belly. One day the Foster Brothers were standing on a promontory, on the other side of which they saw twelve ships lying at anchor, and all of them were very large. They rowed rapidly towards the ships, and asked who was the commander of the warriors. A man who stood leaning on the mast made answer, And Gantier is my name. I am a son of Jarl Hermund of Gautland, said Thorstein. You are a hopeful fellow. How old are you? Made answer he. I am now nineteen years old. Asked Belly. Which do you prefer? To give up your ships and fee or fight the battle with us? Said Angantir. The more unequal your terms are, the more promptly I will make my choice. I prefer to defend my fee and fall sword in hand, if such be my fate. Said Belly. Busk yourself then, but we will make the attack. Then both of them bust themselves for the battle and took their weapons. I said Thorstein to Belly. There is very little of noble courage in attacking them with fifteen ships, as they only have but twelve. I said Belly. Why shall we not lay three of our ships aside? And so they did. A hard battle was now fought. Angantyr's warriors dealt so heavy blows that Belly and Thorstein declared that they had never been in greater peril. They fought the whole day until evening, but in such a manner that it could not be seen which party would gain the victory. The next day they readied themselves again for the fight. Then said Angantyr, To me it seems, King Belly, that it would be wiser not to sacrifice any more of our men, but let the two of us fight a duel, and he who conquers the other in Hongan shall be the victorious party. Belly accepted this challenge, so they went ashore, and having thrown a blanket under their feet, they fought bravely until Belly became tired out and began to receive wounds. Thorstein thought it evident that Belly would not gain the victory over Angantyr, and it came to pass that Belly was not only exhausted, but also on his last breath. Said Thorstein then, It seems best to me, Angantyr, that you cease your fighting, for I see that Belly is so exhausted that he has almost gone. On the other hand, I will not be mean enough to play the dastard towards you and assist him. But if you become the bane of Belly, then I will challenge you to fight a duel with me. And as to personal valour and strength, I think there is no less difference between me and you than there is between you and Belly. I will slay you in a home gang duel, and it would be a great loss if you both die. Now I offer you this condition, that if you spare Belly's life, we will enter into foster brotherhood upon mutual oaths said Angantyr. To me it seems a fair offer that Belly and I enter into foster brotherhood, but it seems to me a great favour that I may become your foster brother. Then this was resolved upon and secured by firm pledges on both sides. They opened a vein in the hollow of their hands, crept beneath the sod, and there they solemnly swore that each of them should avenge the other if any one of them should be slain by weapons. Then they reviewed their warriors and two ships of each party had lost all their men. They healed those who were wounded, and thereupon they left the place with twenty-three ships, returning home in the fall. They spent the winter at home quietly, and enjoyed great honour. Now none were thought more famous on account of their weapons than these foster brothers. 22. When spring opened, the foster brothers readied themselves for departing from home, and had thirty ships. They sailed to the east and harried in Sweden, and all parts of the Baltic. As usual, they carried on their warfare in a seeming manner, slaying Vikings and pirates wherever they could find them, but leaving bondies and chapmen in peace. On the other hand, it is to be told that Oten Faxi, when he heard of the death of his brother Utha, thought it a great loss, and of him it is to be related that for three summers together he searched for the foster brothers. Now it is to be furthermore related that Belly and his men one day laid their ships near some small rocky islands called Brenner's Isles. They cast anchor and readied themselves well. Hereupon, all three foster brothers went ashore and proceeded until they came to a small byre. There stood a man outside the door splitting wood. He was clad in a green cloak, 
and was a man of astonishing corpulency. He greeted Thorstein by name. Said Thorstein, We differ widely as to our faculty for recognition. You greet me by name, but I do not remember I have ever seen you before. What is your name? Says he. My name is an uncommon one. I'm called Brenner. I am a son of Vifel, and a brother of your father, Viking. I was born at the time when my father was engaged in warfare, and had his home with Hluga. I was raised on this island, and I have lived here since. But have you, my nephew Thorstein, heard anything about the Viking Utenfaxi? Answered Thorstein. No. What can you tell me about him? Answered Brenner. This I can tell, that he has been searching for you during the last three winters, and now he lies here on the other side of those islands with all his fleet. He wants to avenge his brother Ufa the Unlucky. He has forty ships, all of which are very large, and he himself is as big as a troll, and no weapons can bite him. Said Thorstein. What is to be done now? Answered Brenner. I can give you no advice, unless you have a chance to meet the dwarf Sindri. Moreover, he will least of all be embarrassed in finding out what ought to be done. Asked Thorstein. Where can I expect to find him? Made answer Brenner. His home is in the island which lies near the shore, and it is called Smaller Brenner's Isle. He lives in a stone. I scarcely hope you will be able to find him, but you are welcome here tonight. Said Thorstein. Something else must be done than to keep quiet. Then they went to their ships, and Thorstein launched a boat and rowed to the island. He went ashore alone, and when he came to a little stream, he saw two children, a boy and a girl, playing on its banks. Thorstein asked their names. The boy called himself Herod, and the girl Herod. Said she, I have lost my gold ring, and I know this will make my father's sentry cross, and I think I may look for punishment. Said Thorstein, Here is a gold ring which I will give to you. She accepted the gold ring and was pleased with it. Said she, I will give this to my father, but is there nothing I might do that may be of service to you? Answered Thorstein, Nothing, but bring your father here that I may have a talk with him, and manage the matter in such a manner he may be able to advise me concerning those things which are of importance to me. Answered Herod, I can do this, only provided that my brother Herod acts according to my will, for Sindri will never refuse him anything. Said Herod, You know I take your part in everything. Thorstein unbuckled a silver belt which he wore and gave it to him. To it was attached a beautifully ornamented knife. Said the boy, This is a nice present. I shall take all possible pains to promote your wish. Wait here until I and my sister come back. Thorstein did so, and after a long while the dwarf Sindri came, accompanied by the boy and his sister. Sindri greeted Thorstein heartily and said, What do you want of me, Thorstein? Made answer Thorstein. I want you to give me advice as to how I may conquer the Viking Otenfaxi. Answered Sindri. It seems to me wholly impossible for any human being to vanquish Faxi, for he is worse to deal with than anybody else, and I will advise you not to fight any battle with him, for you will only lose your men, and hence the best thing for you to do is to turn your prows away from this island tonight. Made answer Thorstein. That shall never be. Though I knew it before that I should lose my life, I would rather choose that than flee from danger before it has even been tried. Said Sindri. I can see you are a very great champion, and I suggest to you that you unload all your ships this night, bring all valuable things on shore, and that you load the ships again with wood and stones. Then ready yourself early tomorrow morning, and come to them before they wake. Thus, you may be able to surprise them in their own tents. You need do all this if there is to be any show of you gaining a victory over Faxi. Or I will tell you this, that so far is common iron from biting him, that he cannot even be scathed by the sword Angervado. Here, here is a belt, Dirk, 
which my daughter Herod will give you, unless reward you for the gold ring. And I am of the opinion that it will bite Otunfaxi, if you use it skillfully. My son, Herod, proposes this as a reward for the belt, that you shall name my name if you seem to be hard-pressed. Now, we must part for a while. Fare you well, and good luck to you. By my power of enchanting, I promise that my disease shall always follow and assist you. Hereupon Thorstein went to his boat and rowed to his men. Straight away afterward in the night, he readied himself and brought the fee out of the ships. He put stones in them instead, and when this was done, the old man Brenner came down from his byre, holding in his hand a large club, which was all covered with iron and large iron spikes, and so heavy that a man with common strength could scarcely lift it from the ground. Said Brenner, This hand weapon I will give you, my nephew Thorstein. You alone can manage it on account of its weight, but yet, it will be rather light for a fight with Otenfaxi. Now it seems to me that it would be a wise measure if Agonantir would take the sword Anger Vadal and you fight with this club. For although it is no handy weapon, still it will prove fatal to many a man. Now, my nephew, I would like to be able to help you more. I have not had the opportunity. Then Brenner turned and went back from the shore. 23. When they had made ready, they rode quickly around the ness, and then they saw the place where Otunfaxi and all his naval force were lying. Without delay, they sent forth a shower of stones so hard and vehemently that they slew more than a hundred men in their sleep, having taken them by surprise. But from the moment when the warriors awoke, they made powerful resistance. Then a bloody battle was fought. A large number of the men of the Foster Brothers fell, for it could almost be said that Otunfaxi shot from every finger. So it went on until night set in. The ten of the Foster Brothers ships were cleared. On the second day the battle began anew, and the slaughter was no less than the day before. They tried several times to board Faxi's ship, and every time they made great slaughter, but they never succeeded in boarding a lady, both because Faxi defended her and because her sides were so high. But in the evening, all the ships of the Foster Brothers were cleared, excepting the dragon called Ufus Nott. On both days, they saw that two men came from the island, and that they took their positions, one on one crack, and the other on another, both shooting with all their might at Faxi's ship. Here they saw the dwarf Sindri, every one of those arrows brought down a man, and in this manner a great many of Faxi's men lost their lives. The one on the other crag was Brenner, who was shooting more like a bowman out against the ships. It did happen occasionally that stones came flying over the ships, and every one was thrown by Brenner, inclined to go to the bottom, and as a consequence of this, many of Faxi's ships sunk. Thus it happened that all his ships too had been cleared, excepting Elide. This battle took place at a time of the year when the nights are bright, and therefore they fought the whole night. Thorstein, together with Ankantir and Beli, tried to board the dragon, but there were many men left on Elide. Faxi ran forward against the foster brothers, Ankantir and Beli, and a good many blows were given and received. But no iron weapons would bite Faxi, and before they had fought very long, Angantir and Beli began to receive wounds. At this moment, Thorstein approached, and with his club he smote the cheek of Faxi, in the way that it came handiest for him, but Faxi did not even lout the least at the blow. Thorstein smote again, just as hard as before, and now Faxi did not like the blows, but plunged himself overboard into the sea, so that only the soles of his feet could be seen. To both Beli and Angantir, it seemed disgusting to follow him, but Thorstein ran overboard and swam after the fleeing Faxi, who looked like a whale. Thus, a long time passed until Faxi landed, but the Foster Brothers fought with those men who were still left, and did not cease until they had slain all aboard the dragon. Then they took a boat and rowed it ashore towards Faxi and Thorstein. But Faxi, having landed, seized a stone and threw it at Thorstein, just as the latter was swimming towards the shore. He warded off the blow by diving and swam out of reach of the stone, which made a great splash as it fell. Faxi took up another stone and a third one, both of which went the same way as the first. But meanwhile, 
the foster brothers Angantyr and Beli approached. When Thorstein sprang overboard, he threw his club backwards, but Beli had taken it up, and now, having reached the spot where Utenfaxi was standing, he smote him in the back part of the head with the club. This he did and interrupted again, while Angantyr at the same time was pelting him with large stones. Now Faxi's skull began to ache considerably, and not liking to receive their blows, he plunged himself from the crag down into the sea and swam from the shore, pursued by Thorstein. Faxi, observing this, turned against Thorstein, and a wrestle between the two swimming antagonists now took place, in which there were great fearful tussles. They were alternately drawn into the deep by each other, and yet Thorstein found that Faxi's strength was greater than his own, and it came to pass that Faxi brought Thorstein to the bottom, and thus he lost the power of swimming. Now, Thorstein, being almost sure that Faxi intended to bite his throat to pieces, said, How could I ever want you more than now, Dwarf Sindri? And suddenly he observed that Faxi's shoulder was seized by a grip, so powerful that he soon sank to the bottom, with Thorstein upon him. Thorstein, who by this time had become very tired from the struggle, seized the belt knife which had been given to him by Sindri, and stabbed Faxi in the breast, sinking the knife into his body up to the handle, and then slashing his belly down to the lower abdomen. But still he found that Faxi was not yet dead, for now said the latter, A great deed you have done, Thorstein, in putting me to death, for I have fought ninety battles and been victorious in all excepting this. In duels I have been the victor eighty times, so that I certainly may say I have had a home can, but now I am ninety years old. Thorstein thought it useless to let him go on prattling any longer, if he could do anything to prevent it, and so he tore away from him everything that was loose within him. Now the saga goes on to tell about Angantyr and Beli, that they took a boat and rowed it out on the sea, searching for Faxi and Thorstein, but for a long time they did not find them anywhere. At last they came to a place where the sea was mixed with blood and quite red. They thought it must be that Faxi was at the bottom of the water, and that he had slain Thorstein, and after a while they saw some nasty thing floating upon the surface of the sea. They went nearer and saw some large horrible-looking bowels floating there. Shortly afterward, Thorstein emerged from the water, but so exhausted and outdone that he could not keep himself afloat. Then they rode over to him and dragged him on board. At this time, there was but little hope of his life, and still he was not much wounded, but the flesh of his body was almost torn from his bones into knots. They went away and procured some relief for him, after which he soon came to his senses. They went back to the islands and made a search of the battlefield for the slain, but only thirty men were found fit to be healed. Then they went to the old man Brenner, thanking him for his assistance. Thorstein went to the lesser Brenner's isle to call on the dwarf Sindri, to whom he made splendid presents, and thus they parted in great friendship. Thorstein got the dragon lady as his lot of the booty, while Beli got Ufa's knot, and Angantyr so much gold and silver as he wished. Thorstein gave his uncle Brenner all the ships which they could not bring away with them. And so, with three ships, they left him and back to Song, where they spent the winter. 24. In the spring, they set out for warfare again, and Gantir asked whether they should turn their prows, saying that he thought that the Baltic had already been cleared of Vikings. Said King Billy, Let us then take our course into the western waters, for we have never been harrying there before. So they did, and having reached the Orkneys, they went ashore and waged war, destroying the inhabited parts of these islands by fire and plundering the fee. And so fearfully did they carry out their depredations, that all living things fled for fear of them. Herod was the Jarl who ruled the islands. When he heard of their depredations, he gathered an army to meet them, and marched by day and night until he found them at an island called Pap Isle. Here it came to a battle between them, and their troops were equal. For two days they fought in such a manner that it could not be seen which party would be victorious. At last the slaughter began to lean to the disadvantage of Herod, whose ships were cleared, so that the brothers succeeded in boarding them, and finally Jarl Herod fell, together with most of his men. 
Hereupon they made expeditions all throughout the islands, which they subjugated, and then readied themselves for the journey home. King Beli offered to make Thorstein Jarl of all the islands, but the latter declined, saying, I would rather be a hairseer and not part with you, than have the name of Jarl and live so far away. Then Beli offered Angantir the Jarlship of those islands, which was accepted. The latter became Jarl and was to pay an annual tribute. Afterward, they returned home to Song, where they stayed the next winter, keeping their men well, both as to weapons and clothes. And now none were thought to be superior to the foster brothers. Children were granted to them. The sons of Beli were called Helga and Hafdan, and his daughter was Ingeborg. She was the youngest of the children. Thorstein had a son called Frithjof. Harold grew up in the island with Grimm, but when he had reached the age of maturity, he set out harrying and became a most noted man, although not much is spoken of him in the saga. He kept his nickname, being called Harald Kizia, and a large family is descended from him. Thorstein, Beli, Grimm and Harald remained friends for as long as they lived. 25. Now we must return to Jokul, Njorfa's son, who ruled the uplands after the death of Njorfa and Viking. They had preserved their friendship well until their death. Jokul won ships in fee and was a daring Viking, treating his soldiers fairly well but no better. A few years passed in such a manner that he was the most noted Viking, harrying most of the time in the waters of the Baltic. Thorstein and Beli had not long been home before they readied themselves for harrying expeditions, and sailing first down along the coast of the country, then through the Sound, they harried in Saxland during the summer and got great booty, consisting of gold and silver, and many other costly things. Afterward, they intended to sail home, which they did, and having reached the mouth of the Lim Fjord, they were overtaken by a violent storm, which carried them out to sea, and in a short time, the ships were separated. Then the sea began to break over the ships from both sides, and all the men were engaged in bailing out water. And it came to pass that this storm drove the dragon Elide, tossed by the waves, ashore alone at Borgen's home. At the same time, Jokul also landed there with ten ships, all thoroughly equipped both as to weapons and crew. And now, as might be imagined, Jokul attacked Thorstein and his men. Thorstein was poorly prepared, for he and his crew were very much exhausted from hard work and from being tossed about on the sea. A severe and bloody battle was fought, and Jokul, being very vehement, kept cheering his men on, telling them that they would never have a better chance to conquer Thorstein. And, said he, it will be an everlasting shame upon us if he escapes now. Then they attacked Thorstein and his men, not letting up until all his men had fallen, so that nobody but Thorstein alone remained standing on the dragon. But still he defended himself bravely, so that for a long time they could not give him a single wound. At last, however, it came to pass that they came so near to him that they could stab him with their spears. But most of them he cut out of his reach, for the sword Angervadl bit as keenly as ever. Then Jokul made a desperate attack and stabbed Thorstein with his spear through the thigh. At that same moment, Thorstein dealt Jokul a blow, hitting his arm below the elbow and cutting the hand off. Meanwhile, they succeeded in surrounding Thorstein with shields and capturing him, but it was near night, so that they thought it was too late to put him to death, and so fetters were put on his feet, his hands were tied with bowstring, and twelve men were sent to watch him during the night. When all had been brought ashore, excepting those twelve men together with Thorstein, he said, Which do you prefer, that you amuse me or that I amuse you? They said that he could not care much for amusement now, as he was about to die immediately on the morrow. Now Thorstein, finding himself in close quarters, conceived a plan of escaping, and in a low, whispering voice he said, At what other time could I need you more than just now, my dear fellow Sindri? Had not all our friendship already been broken off? Then darkness came upon the watchmen, and they all fell asleep. Thorstein saw Sindri going along the ship, approaching him, and saying, you are in close quarters, my dear fellow Thorstein, 
and it certainly is high time to help you. Sindri blew open the lock, then he cut the bowstring off Thorstein's hands, and Thorstein, who had thus become free, now seized his sword, for he knew where he had left it, and turning against the watchmen, he killed them all. Hereupon Sindri disappeared, but Thorstein took a boat and rowed it to shore, and went home to song. This meeting with Beli was a very happy one, and to the latter it seemed as if he had recovered Thorstein from the domains of hell. Early the next morning, after the battle, Yokul awoke, happy in the thought that he was about to take the prisoner and kill him. But when they came to the place where they had left him, the prisoner was gone, and the watchmen dead. To them this was a very great loss. Yokul turned his prows homeward, greatly dissatisfied with his voyage, having lost Thorstein and received scars that could never be healed. Henceforth, he was called Yokel, the One-Handed. The foster brothers, King Beli and Thorstein, gathered an army and went to the uplands, sending a message to Yokel and preparing a battlefield for him. Yokel gathered men, although on account of their friendship with Thorstein, many of his subjects remained at home, and thus, getting only a few, he durst not engage in battle, but fled out of his land, and went to Valent to his brother-in-law, William. The latter gave him a third part of his kingdom to rule. King Beli and Thorstein conquered the uplands, whereupon they returned home and kept quiet. Some time later, there came men from Valent to meet Thorstein. They had been sent out by Yokul, and their errand was to offer Thorstein, in the name of Yokul, terms of peace. They were to have a meeting in Limfjord, to which both should come with three ships each, and there they should settle their dispute. Thorstein was very much pleased with this offer, confessing that it was contrary to his wish that he had troubles with Yoko, saying that he had entered into them unwillingly on Yorfis' account, and on the account of the latter's friendship with Viking. Now this was agreed upon. The ambassadors returned home, but in the summer Thorstein readied himself for going abroad, taking with him Elidi and two other ships. To Beli, this voyage did not seem a hopeful one, for he looked upon Yokul as a treacherous and faithless man. He advised Thorstein to send spies ahead and find out whether everything was done faithfully on Yokul's part, and having found this out, they should return and meet him in the Sound. They did so, and came back, reporting that Yokul and his party were lying at anchor in Limfjord, and keeping perfectly quiet. So they proceeded on their voyage, until they reached the fjord. Here they held a meeting in the place agreed upon and came to mutually satisfactory terms on the conditions that the loss of men, the wounds and the blows should be considered even on both sides. But Yokel should get his kingdom back and not be tributary to anyone. Thorstein's kingdom in the uplands should fall to Yokel's lot in compensation for the loss of his hand. On these conditions they were to be fully reconciled. Then Yokel went home to his kingdom and kept quiet while Thorstein and Beli went home to Sol, settled in their kingdoms, and made an end to all warfares. Ingeborg, Thorstein's wife, had already died, and Ingeborg, Beli's daughter, had her name. Frithjof grew up with his father. Thorstein had a daughter called Vifreya, who at this point of her saga had reached the age of maturity, for she was begotten in the cave of Skilinefia, and there she was born too. In wisdom, she was like her mother. She got Angerradl after the death of her father Thorstein, and many excellent men are descended from him. By all, Thorstein was considered the most distinguished and most excellent man of his time. With these contents, we now finish the saga of Thorstein, the king's son, and it is a most amusing one. Thank you for listening to this wonderful saga, but I must share a little something with you. The tale is not quite over. A new saga, intricately connected to this one, is on its way. My sincere thanks to my Patreon family. As always, you make this podcast a reality and a joy to record. Please do feel free to get in touch. You can email me on mlegendlore at gmail.com or find me on Twitter at Laura Myth, or even pop along to patreon.com 
forward slash myth legends lore. I'm Siobhan Clark. Thank you for listening to the Myth, Legends and Lore podcast.